Good afternoon, everyone. Thank you for uh, participating in this webinar organized by the IAI and the Litoral Polytechnic School and Universidad de Valle, Guatemala. This is a seminar on the co-benefits of adaptation mitigation in South America, the main takeaways of the sixth uh, IPCC report. I am Lucia Caldeiro. I am a capacity building assistant at the IAI. Please remember that we do have interpretation into English, Spanish, and Portuguese. And this webinar is also being recorded and we will be uploading it um, on YouTube and our social media. Now I would like to give the floor to my colleague, Ana Stuart Ibarra, who's a science director of the IAI. Thank you, Lucia. Welcome everyone to this event. First of all, I'd like to thank our moderator and the panelists as well that are here with us today. They will be sharing with us their experiences regarding this um, uh, sixth IPCC uh, report focusing on the co-benefits of adaptation and mitigation for climate change. On Tuesday, we had a similar event focusing on Central America and Central America and the Caribbean. This is a second event, the first of a number of events to be held by the IAI to share this very important information as presented in the very latest IPCC report. I would like to introduce today's moderator, Dr. Edwin Cantellano Lopez. He is a director of the uh, Sustainable Economic Observatory at the Research Institute University del Valle, Guatemala. Until April 2020, he was the Dean of said research institution. And until 2017, he was the director of the Environmental Research Center of the Universidad del Valle. Dr. Castellanos has a PhD in environmental science awarded by Indiana University and a master's degree in analytical chemistry awarded by Michigan State University. He participates in the IPCC as a lead uh, coordinating author in the sixth assessment report. He participated in the chapter on vulnerability and adaptation for Central and South America. Besides climate change, he's also interested in governance and the community management of natural resources, especially forests and water. His scientific work has been acknowledged, for instance, through the National Science Technology Medal awarded in 2016. He was also the president of the uh, Scientific Technical uh, Advisory Group at the IAI. Thank you so much, Edwin. Thank you so much, Anna, for this introduction. And thank you to the IAI for this invitation. It's an, an honor for me to moderate this event. We will be talking about the co-benefits of adaptation and mitigation in South America based on the uh, sixth uh, assessment report as published by the IPCC. It's an, it's an honor for me to moderate this event with three main South American scientists, and I can call them my friends as well. Without further ado, I would like to begin with uh, the first panelist. She comes from Argentina. Dr. Ines Camiloni. She holds a PhD in atmospheric sciences awarded by the University of Buenos Aires. She is an associate professor at the um, Department of Atmospheric and Ocean Sciences at the School of Exact Natural Sciences, University of Buenos Aires. She's also a CONICET researcher at the Center for Marine and Atmospheric Research. She is the director of the master's degree in environmental sciences, UBA. She is a member of the scientific advisory board at the Inter-American Institute for Global Environmental Change. And she is also a lead author of the sixth IPCC report, Working Group 1. So Ines today will be talking about the findings of the report according to the work done by Working Group 1 uh, on Latin America. Thank you, Edwin, for the introduction. Thank you, Anna and Lucia, for uh, inviting me to participate in this webinar. I would like to share this presentation. I think it will 
it's an introduction to the topic, but I think it goes beyond some of the results that were presented in working in the IPCC's Group 1 based on the physical basis of climate change. This provides us with more information when we have to conduct studies related to impact, vulnerability and adaptation and how all these factors interact uh, with adaptation. The, the most solid results presented in the report have to do with the fact that climate change is already affecting every region on Earth in multiple ways. This has to do with changes in temperature, in precipitation levels, of course, in air circulation patterns, also uh, sea surface temperature. The, of course, there are, there are now more extreme events. Basically, climate change is telling us there is no, uh, the report tells us that there is no uh, place on Earth uh, that goes unaffected by climate change. How can we present these results and findings um, as reported by Working Group 1? Have a look at this map. This is, uh, this is related to Working Group 2 uh, and it geographically represents in South America and the various sub regions where the IPCC has worked and works on for this report. This, the map includes South America and also Central America. It shows us how in each region there are different hazards as posed by climate change and these threats already uh, are already appearing also the confidence level and we need to see if the threats increase, decrease or there might be even, uh, events when both things happen. These threats are related to temperature and not just mean temperature but also extreme temperature events. There are also extreme cold events cold waves, uh, changes in precipitation levels, and not just mean values, but also in extreme uh, precipitation levels. Uh, this also has to do with droughts, uh, landslides, floods, uh, wind speed changes, wildfires, and changes that, are real, that have to do with the sea level. I will not go into detail um, regarding each region, but generally speaking, have a look at the map. We can see that purple prevails in, in most regions, and this uh, indicates increases which have to do with the increase of mean temperature and increase in temperature extremes. This shows us that heat is clearly a threat uh, throughout our South American region in particular. And especially regarding precipitation, there are, cha there are significant changes in some areas of South America uh, with higher uh, rainfalls and also precipitation extremes. And this is related to um, floodings as well in the southeast, southeast of South America, have a look at these acronyms, SES. But let us now focus on the central uh, area of the Pacific coast. So the opposite happens. There is uh, precipitation levels decrease and this entails a threat because uh, droughts are more likely to happen. Also, uh, there is a higher threat of wildfires in many regions of South America. Here, we only include cases that have to do with uh, changes that have been observed and that have a high confidence level. 
the changes that we have observed in the future and with uh, rising global temperatures will uh, actually uh, worsen. This can be seen in a similar map where we can see the changes for the short term and they have to do with the increased temperature um, of about two degree, two Celsius degrees. Have a look at the purple and how it prevails over the continent. So this is increased temperature, more um, heat events. Uh, there is an increase in rainfall levels as well. Extreme precipitation, intense uh, precipitation, and this leads to floodings. And, and the opposite happens in other regions where there are, um, where rainfall levels are lower. And this is the case, for instance, in the, in the west of the continent on the Pacific coast and the central region. So uh, precipitation would uh, reduce further in the coming decades and this increases the, the risk of wildfires and it, it would uh, compromise also water availability when there are uh, extreme events and this also affects snow availability, which affects uh, river volumes. Therefore, our region has significant, significant changes. And these changes uh, will actually become uh, worse or stronger in the short term. And this actually intersects with the vulnerability of some sectors in our region when it comes to climate change. This vulnerability can be analyzed uh, according to food availability, water availability, and um, why urban areas and their infrastructure are more vulnerable, uh, and also why uh, land and water ecosystems are vulnerable. Have a look at the prevailing colors bright red in many regions. Therefore, we have high vulnerability levels and there is a high confidence level as well. We can say therefore that not just in South America but also in Central America, we have areas that are highly exposed to climate change and these areas are also uh, highly vulnerable to these climate changes solutions uh, when it comes to addressing these uh, overlapping, uh, these threats that overlap with vulnerabilities. There are two solutions uh, or strategies, adaptation and mitigation. And these can also create co-benefits and they can also fulfill other social objectives and not just the ones that have to do with facing climate change regarding its causes and consequences. We need to also understand that some of these mitigation and adaptation actions might have um, unexpected consequences. Therefore, when we talk about co-benefits, we refer to the positive effects that a policy or measure uh, addressing climate change may have. And these, uh, these actions are beneficial um, for society and the environment. These co-benefits occur when we implement mitigation or adaptation actions that have a, positively, a positive and significant impact on adaptation or mitigation. Therefore, the main challenge is to create strategies and policies in order to create these co-benefits and synergies among mitigation and adaptation policies. They should also contribute to attaining some of these other sustainable development goals or goals in general, for instance, the 17 SDGs. 
we have different examples uh, depending on the IPCC contexts. One, the first example is on cities, settlements and infrastructure. And there is also the areas of agriculture, forestry and other land uses. Cities, settlements and infrastructure. Central and South America is very important. We need to assess it uh, depending on uh, adaptation and mitigation because it is a highly urbanized region. It includes five mega cities, cities with over 10 million inhabitants. It has a, a high uh, population density in urban and coastal areas. Therefore, uh, sea level rise is an issue um, because it creates, uh, it makes urban people more vulnerable as well. These are not the only threats that may affect cities in urban areas, but there are others that have to do with, for instance, extreme heat, droughts, uh, floods, landslides, heavy storms, depending on, on each um, region. Therefore, there are several vulnerability determinants within cities in South America. And this is also affected by asymmetries and how access to services uh, differs for different people. Also, differences in housing deficits, informality, poverty, and the occupation or settlement in risk areas because they are very much affected by climate change. Therefore, in this, in this vulnerability context, we can find an opportunity to create adaptation and mitigation actions. And we can, well, think about creating synergies regarding these strategies and their co-benefits. Working group number three, um, I will not go into detail, but of course you can find this information, this type of chart where you can see uh, various mitigation alternatives in this case to address urban systems that have to do, for instance, with urban land use and spatial planning, electrification of the urban energy system, and also how all of this interacts with SDGs. And here we can clearly identify the, re the benefits that are related to these mitigation actions and enable us to work in this sense. We can combine co-benefits and benefits and you can uh, find them on the chart with a plus sign on each SDG on this table. And the, th the same thing applies to agriculture and foods. We need to understand that the impact on food production is negative on several pro pro crops in the South American region. And projections show that these trends in crop yields will continue into the future and therefore when Thinking about mitigation strategies in these sectors, the IPCC shows once again that there are interaction opportunities between the mitigation actions and the SDGs based on which we can identify co-benefits or synergies. All of the IPCC report information is available on this site and through the different social media where the IPCC shares information and that would be all on my end. Thank you. Thank you, Dr. Ines Camiloni for your overview of group number one, climate science. And thank you for presenting these climate hazards that are already being observed and those expected in the future. Thank you all for joining us. Good morning or good afternoon, depending where you are. And let me remind you that we are welcoming three distinguished panelists today. 
And at the end of the session, we will have a Q&A section. Please submit your questions in the chat. And well, you could introduce yourself or you can let us know where you're joining us from to make the, the, the session more interactive. Thank you, Ines, once again. And we will give the floor over to our second panelist of the day. She's joining us from Venezuela and it, it is a great pleasure for me to welcome Dr. Noemi Chacon, who's an associate researcher and head researcher of the Ecosystem and Global Change Laboratory at the Venezuelan Institute for Scientific Research, EBIT, and she researches on the biogeochemical nutrient cycle in tropical forests and the changes resulting from climate change, the role of indigenous knowledge in the preservation and restoration of forests in the face of the changes in soil, a decolonizing and transdisciplinary approach, lead her research and socio-ecological interaction in forest ecosystem. She is the leading publisher for RE6, the sixth report of the IPCC in working group number two, focusing on impact adaptation for the Central and South America chapter. We are so happy to welcome Dr. Noemi Chacon. Noemi, you have the floor. Thank you, Edwin, for such nice introduction. And thank you to IAI for inviting me to share this topic with you today. So let me, let me start my presentation and I will share my screen with you. Can you see it? Yes, no, I mean, it's all set. Thank you. So today we're going to speak about go benefits of mitigation and adaptation strategies in South America. I am focusing in particular about land and freshwater ecosystems and their services and it is something that hits very close to my field of study. To provide some brief background, the agreements reached through the Paris Agreement in 2015 that was signed at the time by 175 countries. And the commitment was to substantially reduce GAG emissions, to curb the increase of temperature below 2C, 2 degrees, and to really try to curb the increase below 1.5 as compared to pre-industrial values. The Paris Agreement is subscribed by 195 countries who have committed through their NDCs to generate climate actions to reach such objectives. So through adaptation and mitigation actions to that are based in three dimensions, social, economic, and environmental. All of this to build synergies with the 2030 Agenda and the 17 SDGs. So having said that, let me show you a chart of observed and projected impacts produced based on the assessment of the sex assessment report that was recently published. And there were eight sectors under study for our region. Yes, eight. Out of these eight sector, for this presentation, I selected terrestrial and freshwater ecosystems and their services for different reasons. One, time constraints. Second, because it is part of my field of expertise. And third, it's because if you, can, if you look at the chart, this is one of the items that will have 
that will suffer the greatest impacts, not only nowadays, but the trend for the future is projected to carry the same trajectory. Adaptation and mitigation actions in this sector mainly target ecosystem-based adaptation and community-based adaptation. Those were the two great lines based on the assessment made. Ecosystem-based adaptation focused on protected areas. Protected areas are one of the most widespread adaptation areas for our region and community-based focused on raising awareness on all of those actions where indigenous and, and, and local knowledge on, on, on local processes for disaster risk reduction and reducing the impact of climate change. With regards to protected areas, one of the actions that will lead to significant co-benefits and social well-being now adaptation based on local knowledge is also thought to lead is also seen as one of the most important adaptation strategies for our region now looking at the co-benefits and as you can see on screen, the information in that chart goes a little bit beyond of what the report states. This will include the most recent literature. We can see that with regards to the environmental co-benefits, both adaptation actions will lead to similar results. That is, there is an increase in ecosystem resilience protection of biodiversity, and protection of soil, water, and air. However, when looking at the co-benefits, at the socioeconomic co-benefits, we see that there are differences between both adaptation actions. When looking at the social and financial benefits, of protected areas and ecosystem-based adaptation. Basically, those actions that target the, or that focus the market or focus on recreational spaces There are social co-benefits that contribute to human well-being, but there, this is mainly focused to particular human well-being. I mean, we can see how these areas generate employment opportunities for the local population. For example, in the service sector, there's greater engagement with different markets. technical cooperation, opportunities, investment opportunities with international organizations. And this is a co-benefit, of course, that will impact social well-being. Now, I think that we cannot see the socioeconomic benefits for the community itself. And of all of these communities and societies that live around protected areas with quite distinct organizational systems where the common good or collective good is prioritized over individual good. Now, when we look at community-based adaptation, where it does take into account local and indigenous knowledge on the processes carried out in the region, 
we can see that there are there is a significant number of socioeconomic co benefit protecting the local community, local culture, community organization, reduction in immigration, protection of livelihood, and one of these measures would ensure community engagement in a bottom-up approach, favoring local economy and local technologies and reducing, therefore, dependency on foreign markets. Although there are significant differences between both types of adaptation, we can see that both contribute significantly to the SDGs, among them number 13, uh, for climate action. Now, looking at, after looking at the socioeconomic co-benefits, I would like to draw your attention to the fact that we need to observe that commitment between protecting and the, and the co-benefits that it is providing for society. We would need to assess the trade-offs or the how we balance those two situations out. So in this context, I wanted to show you or to pay special attention to the Amazon as the Amazon region covers around, and I think the area has increased, it covers twenty two percent of the Amazon territory is considered under a protected area scheme. What is interesting to see is that There is an important indigenous population in the area, approximately 22%. And several articles were published recently showing that the areas and their indigenous governance show a, a lower emission rate, even more so than protected areas. That is another sign that we need to use adaptation measures to protect ecosystems if, of course, considering organizational, local, local organization practices and local knowledge. Some final thoughts. And these really are my personal opinions. I think that the implementation of protected areas as an adaptation or mitigation measure to climate change to generate effective go benefits in the socioeconomic aspect. This will only be possible if we take into account indigenous knowledge, their organizational practices and manage, managing these communities based on the indigenous and local practices. When adaptation me measures are market driven, they may produce unacceptable exclusions, like the separation between the bond of these communities and their livelihood. We would need to pay special attention on adaptation and mitigation initiatives that are being deployed in the Amazon. For In this region, we can find 410 indigenous communities covering 22% of the territory.
which I believe that to really produce substantial co-benefits, we would have to have at least a hybrid administration or at least with a very high percentage of engagement of these indigenous peoples and local communities. Thank you very much. And I am here and happy to answer any questions or hear any observations that you might have about this topic. Thank you, Dr. Noemi Chacon from Venezuela, who provided an overview of the sex and working group number two, focusing on impact and adaptation. She spoke about the observed and projected impact for our region and the co-benefits of adaptation initiatives based on ecosystems and based on communities. Again, welcome everyone who's joining us and welcome everyone who's part of this event. I'm in Guatemala in Central America. I see in the chat that we have participants in Colombia, Bolivia, Brazil, Argentina, Peru, Mexico, Chile. So let me invite you all to continue to introduce yourselves in the chat feature. And you can also submit your questions for our three panelists in the chat feature as well. At the end of the next uh, presentation, we will open the floor for Q&A. So we have heard from group one and group two. We will now moving on to IPCC third working group represented this time by Dr. Mercy Bourbon Cordova. It is really my pleasure to present Dr. Mercy Bourbon Cordova. She's an oceanographer and she has a PhD in environmental sciences in the in New York State University. She's a professor at the Technical School in Spoil, Ecuador, and a senior researcher for the Pacific International Center for Re Disaster Risk Reduction, ESCOL. She was the head of environmental control in Washaki, departmental director of risk assessment and management, and a vice minister of the Ministry of Environment in Ecuador. Mercy is leading author of the Sex Assessment Report, working group number three, focusing on mitigation. And she's also a member of the Human Resources Team for Climate Services of the World Meteorological Organization. Mercy, you have the floor to provide an overview of the... Thank you so much. Thank you, South America, and thank you for this invitation. I'm going to be sharing my screen, my screen now in order to uh, address the co-benefits of adaptation and mitigation in South America, focusing on health systems. So we'll see how we can integrate this sector, which I think should uh, be more relevant. One of the key takeaways, uh, as provided by the main groups, is that unless there are immediate and deep emissions reductions across all sectors, then reaching uh, a 1.5 1, uh, uh, increase is beyond reach. And also to avoid mounting losses, urgent action is required to adapt to climate change. So we need to work uh, emission reduction and adaptation issues uh, simultaneously. In this sense, I would like to share this information with you as provided by the ECLAC. This is the information sent by governments to the United Nations Climate Change uh, Framework Convention regarding their uh, government priorities in the areas of mitigation and adaptation. This is information uh, submitted in 2016. These, uh, these were the priority sectors for adaptation and mitigation. 
we are now working on health in particular and regarding health have a look at this uh, at the diagram here with the red cross uh, symbol this uh, does not appear in every country that presented their NDCs as a priority issue it does appear in more or less half the countries and when there are when both sectors participate for instance energy agriculture changes in land use and forestry activities and others that are related to cities for instance transport waste energy there is no correlation between adaptation and mitigation because um, of course they are specialized and have specific priorities my point is that now we need to determine how we can uh, promote a more efficient integration of every sector so that they can work in a more efficient synergy health is also important because because it is not considered in many many sectors let us go back to the diagram presented by working group 2 regarding the interaction between climate hazard exposure and vulnerability which is it has to do with adapt, adaptive capacity and these three factors uh, combine to create risk this risk impacts uh, human health in two regards first of all climate sensitive uh, diseases for instance adverse health events for instance uh, vector-borne diseases waterborne diseases infectious diseases of every kind heat related uh, illness as well and uh, they are so important and uh, um, we don't know so much about them of course mental health uh, which we which we should address more fully in the region and also under a malnutrition there are also major conflicts in the region regarding migration displacement and other types of conflicts <coughs> uh, regarding extreme events and how they combine with a pandemic we can cite uh, the example of uh, health uh, systems which were overwhelmed and this is what happened when we have what happens when we have climate events um, costs increase so much and and the load increases so much that our systems are not prepared there are other factors or other systems that will be impacted and these are food systems and livelihood systems within our communities uh, have a look at these images this uh, corresponds to a study conducted by myself and dr. Stuart Ibarra this has to do with the determinants um, uh, related to vector-borne diseases I'm trying to focus on cities now and this has an, a direct and indirect impact on health health issues also seasonality is very important we know that uh, I don't know dengue season is coming respiratory disease season is coming we know that but we don't make the necessary connection with the climate change we know that there are, there's a virus uh, you know going around but many times we do not implement epidemiological surveillance also regarding housing and urban services and informal city settlements um, they are uh, a major factor within vulnerability and impact zoonosis as well and mosquitoes you know the the, the vectors that are the, that appear in the region region we need to combine this as well and also vulnerable populations this is a complex interaction which entails that the epidemic load uh, is not the same everywhere have a look at this map when we analyze the sectors that are most affected by a given disease we can detect specific features and this is what we need to understand which are the factors that allow us to take corrective uh, action let us now go back to South America as my colleagues have said before me um, the continent continent will have to sustain a number of impacts and they have to do with droughts and temperature that will result in food insecurity issues 
this will be the case practically throughout the region. Also, uh, floods and landslides, they will uh, affect health indirectly and also uh, our infrastructure. There is also the risk of water insecurity, which is a recurring, recurrent topic in the region. It also affects uh, or increases malnutrition issues and other diseases as well. Uh, epidemics will also cause, uh, because of temperature changes, will cause, cause further changes in ecosystems and in the uh, dynamics of hosts and of the uh, people that can start, you know, uh, migrating and moving around our territories. Therefore, we need to have this systemic view of the issue in order to work uh, in a cross-cutting manner and in a more coordinated way in the area of health. Higher levels, uh, heat risk will cause higher levels of mortality in elderly populations and also uh, depending on where people live, there are clearly visible urban uh, asymmetries in our cities. Also, climate change affects the epidemiology of climate-sensitive infectious diseases. Um, in most of our region, we can uh, find dengue, chikungunya, zika, and the diseases appear in different places every year with different seasonalities. Uh, because this, all of this is connected to El Niño and other seasonal events. In 2020, the, the year of the pandemic, we also had dengue events in some countries where dengue did not appear before. Uh, Paraguay had over 200,000 cases. Argentina had over 40,000 cases. In Peru and Ecuador, dengue is endemic. This will continue increasing within uh, climate uh, projections. Regarding climate change, uh, regarding climate change, it will also af affect the availability of basic services, and this will increase vulnerability and also uh, the incidence of disease. In this context, adaptation and mitigation. Uh, from this health perspective, you know, uh, Pajo says that we should have health throughout our policies. And to do this, this SDG framework should serve as a template to integrate mitigation issues. And this is adopted by several countries in their policies. Um, there might be great synergy, but we should also be careful because we should understand the co-benefits created, uh, but also the potential trade-offs associated with mitigation. This might uh, negatively affect or unfairly affect some populations, and we need to uh, decide how we can protect this, these people. Let us now focus on the urban systems. And I would like to, as Ines has said, but I'd like to focus on health in particular. Regarding human health, how can we have great synergy? Have a look at all these actions that have to do with urban uh, topics, urban land use and spatial planning, energy systems, cooling networks that improve uh, their technologies. In blue, we have the areas with a higher confidence level and higher evidence that these policy packages that articulate these issues can help us improve human health as well. Regarding uh, green, uh, also green and blue infrastructure is essential. Our cities typically have many ecosystems that are not included within the urban landscape. Regarding uh, waste uh, management, we need to be very careful because of climate change asymmetry as well, because we might have, I don't know, maybe 
we might affect a vulnerable community in the way in which we manage waste. Finally, we need to integrate sectors, strategies and innovations with technology, the academia, private companies, so that we can have a huge working and intersectoral interdisciplinary policy group in order to address these topics and so that we can improve the area of human health. These are a few examples, current examples in our cities. For instance, nature-based solutions for water-related adaptation. Uh, we have uh, solutions in the case of floods, uh, also resilience related. There is carbon capture throughout the green ecosystems in the urban and peri-urban areas. And this also, and also public spaces help improve the physical and mental health of the population. Basic infrastructure, and this is a huge uh, debt we owe to the whole region, especially in smaller cities and larger cities as well. The basic infrastructure, which is a right, and it has to do with development. And it should include, of course, drainage, uh, drinking water, sanitation, electricity, land rights, uh, right to the land, to housing. All of this can become an opportunity. And we need to uh, increase uh, everyone's adaptive capacity from local governments to the communities themselves. Because if we do this, we can reduce vulnerability to climate related risks and increase climate resilience. Regarding active urban transport, we need to promote nationwide and local policies in order to facilitate certain processes, for instance, walking, bicycling, which will reduce emissions, of course, and will you know, improve air quality and help promote uh, physical and mental health, uh, physical and mental health and reduce the risk of uh, respiratory diseases. Uh, we need to, to always keep a, a systemic frame of mind. Uh, this prevention improves with infrastructure, but also with education. We also need to work on uh, articulating sectors, uh, doctors, veterinarians, food security systems, early warning systems. We need to think about climate resilience and how it encompasses both elements. And it, they also entail uh, a redu reduction of climate disasters. This fr frame of mind uh, is related to the concept of One Health. Uh, this is a systemic vision, vision of uh, biodiversity and of uh, urban forests in this case, and how that helps well-being and health. We now have this planetary health framework. Uh, basically, we won't uh, be healthy as, as humans if the planet is not healthy. But to do this, we need to share knowledge within communities, municipalities, uh, uh, and uh, with national authorities as well, so that we can act when the next uh, epidemic outbreak appears. Finally, I would like to say that this accelerated climate action is essential to sustainable development. To do this, there is this a uh, proposal for a governance for climate resilient development, which must include long term planning, all of all of government approaches, transboundary cooperation and benefit sharing. And we should also develop pathways so that we can increase adaptation and mitigation and reduce inequality. And finally, there were prior commitments and these these are NDCs. They must be implemented as as fast as possible. Thank you very much. 
the, these are the members of working group three 29% women, 70% men. We need to continue working in, in order to reach equality at this level as well. Thank you very much. Thank you, Dr. Merci Borbor Cordova, for your presentation and for this perspective from Working Group 3 that focuses on mitigation. Once again, remember um, that now we will have a Q&A session. You can uh, share your questions with, uh, with us in the chat and there's also a Zoom section for questions and answers. There's a Q&A section. So, dear participants, uh, please share your questions with us so that we can have an interactive uh, session with our panelists. As Mercy was saying, uh, uh, you had 29% of women working in working group three, but in this event we've had three women panelists, so that's great. So let's see if our participants add some questions. Um, and in the meantime, I would like to ask you some questions. First of all, Ines, who talked uh, about her work within working group one that works with climate and climate models. Ines, the climate information, the model and scenario information is essential for decision making. We uh, he, Today we're focusing on adaptation and mitigation and for instance public servants that need to work on implementing these strategies, these adaptation and mitigation strategies. They should have, you know, this minimum knowledge or they should have access to this information about what we can expect uh, climate wise. So I would like to ask you to thank you and to ask you to tell us a bit more about the availability of this climate information in a in a format that, that is easily easily accessible and also tell us about the atlas published by uh, working group one. I would also like to ask you if there are other information sources that can be easily accessed by someone who is not a specialist in uh, climate models and scenarios. Atlas that resulted from the sex assessment report of the IPCC. This interactive atlas is really the first effort the IPCC has made to make this information available, information on the findings, observed changes and future projections. In a way, we try to make it very interactive and provide information that was user friendly. In the past report, there was an atlas, but there was no interactive. And we really were very open to the demands of decision makers and uh, scientists the needed easier access to the information for the projections and the different databases. And this is how we developed the interactive atlas where you can find all of this information, not just about projections, but also observed changes in the different regions, the different regions in which we divided the the world in the IPCC sex assessment report. It is a website that you can you can access through the IPCC site. It is presented in a very user friendly way, but in addition to that, the IPCC is also hosting dissemination and promotion activities on how to use the interactive atlas. You can find this on the IPCC website as well and the different dates for such courses. I think that that event will take place tomorrow for Latin America. To really make the most out of it, 
and all of the information available here. I think, I, I, I don't know or I'm not familiar with any tool of this nature at the global level. It really entailed a lot of collaborative work among scientists around the world to produce information that was peer reviewed and a lot of database and a lot of information and tools, the tools used to develop the different materials are also available. So it doesn't just provide information, but it is done through a framework of utter transparency and traceability of the data provided, which is something essential when we're going to use this information for decision making purposes. So there's scientific rigor, transparency to really make it very, very safe to use. Great. Thank you, Ines. So you're all encouraged to visit the IPCC website and as Ines said, you will find a link to the interactive atlas so you can explore the information that shows how climate has changed in recent years, but especially how it could change in the future depending the emission models and scenarios. Now, looking at working group number two, I wanted to ask Noemi, and actually one of the questions submitted in the chat is a question that I had thought of for Noemi about integrating communities, but particularly indigenous communities in adaptation processes. And Pedro Borges in the chat wants to know how we can integrate indigenous knowledge into climate action and what are the challenges to do so. So Noemi, what can you say considering the work uh, you've done at the IPCC or how has the IPCC report integrated indigenous knowledge and what challenges do we have looking into the next assessment report? Thank you, Edwin, and, and thank you to the person who asked in the chat about this. There were substantial efforts made in this report to incorporate indigenous and local knowledge. For the assessment. So these indigenous and local knowledge were a topic that was integrated into all chapters. And we also compiled indigenous knowledge, the first compilation really that was published in parallel to the to the report. It was an initiative carried out by several of the authors of the report. And and several indigenous authors also participated in this co compilation to to guide and advise IPCC authors. I think this is a significant, this is significant progress compared to the assessment report number five. In our chapter, for the South American chapter, we produced a case study and a question based on indigenous and local knowledge. What challenges do we have ahead? Well, these knowledge we still have access to this knowledge with people who liaise with us that liaise with the scientific community and there we have to interpret this knowledge and integrate it so the challenge ahead is to to produce methodologies together with the indigenous communities with a decolonizing perspective to be able to engage with them, interact with them and produce knowledge adopting a transcultural and intercultural approach. This is not an easy feat. Easy feat 
as I said earlier, we need to shed that colonial and colonialism approach and work together with them. It's not about doing it ourselves only, producing methodology to really be able to approach and access such community that is essential for preserving life on earth. Thank you, Noemi. Let's continue the discussion with our three panelists. Merci. Based on, on what we read from your bio, you have experience in the academic and in the public sectors. M Mercy was the vice minister of environment and also the director of disaster risk reduction. Mercy, I wanted to ask, wearing the hat of the public servant and as decision maker in the public sector, what which do you think are the main challenges and the main obstacles to implement specific actions against climate change, whether adaptation or mitigation act actions? As a decision maker, what did you think was still needed? Or what did you think uh, would make your job easier? Thank you. I think it is important to consider how we can engage and reach out to decision makers one a government level and then local or sub national levels at the local government level i think that one of the main barriers and main obstacles that really is being addressed substantially is how we we make sure decision makers have access to scientific information. A decision maker will have three, four minutes to listen to a proposal. Maybe the technical team will translate the most particular or needed information to implement a pro program, a plan or a scheme, and then they will see how much it will cost to know if they have the necessary resources to be invested and there's some sort of prioritization process. So deciding what is considered a priority or not and something that might not seem a priority, we need to be able to really justify and provide evidence. So the evidence shows that if we do not invest on nature-based solutions and we don't provide incentives for local and national levels to implement it, we are going to be affected by indirect costs, disaster, hazard, healthcare costs. And that type of information is very practical for decision makers to really be able to say, well, we will implement funding plans, incentives for companies, incentives for local governments to begin working uh, on these, uh, based on this evidence. So that scientific information needs to be translated into an information that is easier to access for operational purposes at the national government level, which is usually the government that decides policies that will go down, that will lead down to the local level. Now at the local level, I think that one of the main barriers, and I'm not speaking about big cities, but rather middle cities, is that, well, how, I, I mean, local governments are vested with the great responsibility of planning the land, planning the territory, delivering basic services, for example, solid waste management, among others, but they do not have all the resources they need. So funding in this case is critical, but funding alone will not make the difference unless we provide training on how to be more efficient and effective. And we need to strengthen these capacities, build systemic capacities. And I think that this systemic approach equals synergy and financial efficiency and impact. What I mean is, if I'm going to invest my resources to implement nature-based solutions, reduce floods, improve sanitation, I am going to solve and I'm going to kill several birds with one stone. Now, and this is really based on my experience in the public administration, I think it is important to translate 
this on how to provide evidence, how to use it more efficiently for more comprehensive outcomes. I think that a systemic approach and synergies between adaptation and mitigation really pose many opportunities at all levels. Thank you, Mercy, for your comments. I think it is, they're very fitting really for the environment and for what we're discussing in this event. This event was organized by the IAI and Mercy, you spoke about well translating scientific knowledge to operating knowledge and you also spoke about training government officials for them to be able to work and make good use of scientific information i think these are two lines of work that the iai i mean based on my experience with this institution has really tried to leverage and try to for many years has attempted to bring scientific knowledge closer to decision makers, provide training for the better use of that information. So that would be a side note for our IAI colleagues who are who are listening. Let me now go to the chat. I see there are different questions in the chat. One of them is a general question, another one might be a bit more interesting, but these are open for the three panelists to to reply. In the first question, they speak about environmental education and they thank you for sharing this information. And it, they ask, what would you recommend for all of us re designing environmental education processes in the different communities? How can we make this information available and engage citizens? This is probably one of the big challenges of the IPCC and usually a big challenge for us scientists to bring information closer to the general population. We were speaking about the government sector, but let's now think about the general public. How can we make that information available to them? So really, I am opening the floor to the three panelists to answer the question. Well, Edwin, I can, I can reply or touch on some of these aspects. When we speak about environmental education, we also need to think about formal and non-formal education. I mean, by in the non-formal education, the media will play an essential role in transferring scientific knowledge and translating scientific knowledge for the population, dissemination and the mass dissemination uh, uh, of this information. So there needs to be collaborative action between scientists and really specialized journalists. We need journalists that specialize in climate change to make sure that the message is clearly delivered, that is not broken down in the different stages, that it's sustained in time and that we don't just speak about climate change whenever there is an extreme event or amid the, the launch of a report like the, the IPCC 6 assessment report, but rather making sure that the information is consistent over time for people to understand that climate change really is a process, that it is in place, that will continue on into the future. So I think that when speaking about education, we need to think about the non-formal aspects and in, in terms of formal education, well, of course, when we speak about climate change, we do speak about a cultural shift. We need to change many of the, the ways in which we consume, in which we produce, in which we, 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 we grow and we develop and we carry out our day-to-day -day lives as citizens. So we need to incorporate all of this knowledge across the different educational levels. In general, we are closer to university education, but really we should start earlier. We should start in the early stages of education. 
and we can do this if we do it only if we do it in articulate manner and if we integrate environmental affairs into the study plans at, at schools and across the, the formal education sector. Thank you, Ines. Merci, Noemi. Is there, I mean, Ines provided quite a comprehensive answer, but is there anything else that you would like to add? I would like to say that for these communication processes to be efficient, I mean, we need to look at our target audience. If it is an indigenous community, sometimes they will have a particular, more ho holistic approach or perspective. But I, I, I agree with what Noemi said, and I am a big fan of co-production processes. So sometimes we only focus on our own view, on our own perspective, and that might, might match that of one part of the community, but not the entire community. So thinking about how to communicate and adopting a more participatory approach and put ourselves in the other person's shoes, even considering the, the most vulnerable populations. For example, I think it is essential to integrate children into these actions. And we should think that climate change is not just an environmental issue, but it's about development. It's a social affair. So what I like about almost 9,000 pages of the report is that they acknowledge that social issues are very much intertwined and uh, we don't just, we shouldn't just worry about the, the environment, but that dynamic interaction with social actors, which is basically where, what has led us to the point where we are at right now with regards to climate change. Great. Noemi? Yeah, let me just add, I mean, to what Mercy and... has said with, as to how to build that message. That message should, should not come from journalists or the media alone, but it is a message that should be developed together with the communities. I mean, unless I experience that impact firsthand, it is hard to to build a message, to try to convey what it really is like. I think climate change, it's not just something to be addressed from an environmental standpoint alone, alone but it should be cross-cutting to all aspects in our lives. So it is a message that we should develop from a bottom-up approach and from those who are younger to adults as we really have to transform the way in which we live. Thank you, Noemi. Uh, as Ines was saying, we need a cultural transformation in the way which consume are produced. And as Mercy was saying in her presentation, this is this shouldn't take place in 30 years time. It must happen now. It requires a huge effort we need to reach the entire population. And as Monica says in the chat, she's uh, commenting on what is being said, there is still remains a huge challenge regarding how we share our scientific information. Monica belie believes that there is a huge gap between the IPCC language, which is calibrated, scientifically calibrated language, and people's everyday lives. The IPCC acknowledges this. I worked in the previous report as well, the fifth report, and, uh, and among other major changes, I know that this the IPCC has really focused on communication and on disseminating the report to the to a more general audience. They trained us to talk to decision makers and journalists. They have a team of communicators that are trying to help us translate scientific information. That was one of the main challenges of writing the 
uh, the summary for decision makers in our group. I'm sure the same thing happened in groups uh, one and three. Uh, uh, we had two challenges. It was very difficult to summarize the thousands of pages Merci mentioned in 15 pages. That was the first challenge. And also, we had to do this in clear and easy to understand language. And in group number two, we interacted with communication specialists so that the message would be as clear as possible. Of course, there are still limitations and challenges, and hopefully the message will reach a population in general. Uh, the next question, I think it's very interesting. I'd like to know what the panelists have to say about this. Rosana Maguinho uh, says, it talks about the study and how it affects how climate change affects humans. I would like to add that actually the study talks about uh, humans, but it also talks about uh, the impacts on uh, natural systems. Noemi Chapon Chagon specializes in natural systems, and they actually studied these impacts not just on humans but on ecosystems in general. In any case, Rosanna says that we might have to mitigate this uh, effect, this climate change effect on humans, because maybe it's a way in which the planet is trying to remain stable by eradicating humans. It's, quite, it's a thought-provoking question. If we do nothing, well, it's better for the planet if we die, uh, so that the planet can uh, be balanced again. I think it's a, a great question, so please go ahead. Well, yes, th there are two perspectives or two views. One, uh, the, the, the view of the indigenous peoples is so wise. They think or they say that we are the earth, we are part of the earth. Uh, then if we have this modern perspective on uh, planetary health, if we say that we want to be healthy, then the planet needs to be healthy. And that uh, is also important because the planet and what's happening shows this imbalance because we've abused the planet. We've abused its resources, services, natural beauty. We haven't appreciated our planet. I think we need to acknowledge that. The thing is that we don't recognize that we are part of, of the whole thing. And uh, have a look at the pandemic. This was an imbalance uh, of biological systems. And this is what happened. This is a consequence of our own actions. We are paying for what we do. So I think that we need to consider ourselves as a part of the whole. That's what we should do. Uh, yes, of course, there is balance in the planet. There is a selection. There might be a process by which some stay, some leave. OK, that proce process exists. But we need to understand that we are not, uh, let's say, taming the system. We are part of the system. We are the system, and we need to you know, protect that balance. Ines and Noemi, would you like to add something to M Mercy's great response? Yes, I would like to say as well that the reports have shown that we have created this climate crisis. This crisis involves us as individuals and it also holds us accountable. We need to remember the comprehensive integrated perspective of indigenous peoples and how we should li live on this earth. It's something that we, we can't understand. Indigenous peoples do not, you know, divide the or separate the cosmovision from their daily lives. And we do the opposite. We uh, 
uh, we separate everything and that has created these problems. I think we are now going through uh, these consequences. We still have time to revert these processes. To do that, we need to articulate our work with different knowledge systems and this will allow us to find efficient measures because science maybe is not enough in this case. We need everyone, we need every knowledge system uh, to work together. Great, thank you Noemi. Ines, anything else that you would like to say? We're almost uh, at the end of the of the seminar. Yes, we need to recognize, we need to admit that we, this is a historical moment. We are as a generation responsible for climate change and its consequences and we're also the generation that can actually find a solution um, that should uh, protect the planet for, for, for the future generations. When we think about future generations, the generations of our children and grandchildren, we do have an ethical responsibility in that sense. We need to do something. I think this is clear. Climate action is necessary. It is urgent. And the, it's not a natural selection process. This is actually the consequences of human actions. In this sense, ethics actually uh, send us along uh, uh, just one path. We need to protect the planet and we need to protect uh, future generations because they're not responsible for what's happening and they're not responsible for a more dangerous climate uh, that they will have. Thank you. Thank you, Ines. So, uh, so we've been together for an hour and a half now. Before I give the floor back to Ana for some closing remarks, Gustavo asks about uh, agricultural ecosystems. We have no more time. Uh, the answers needed and the presentations needed to be uh, very brief and very relevant. But of course, many times these systems are addressed. The report uh, addresses this issue as well. So, Gustavo, please go over uh, uh, the report prepared by Working Group 2. You can write something like agroforestry systems and you will find a lot of information because it is known as a great uh, adaptation measure, especially in, the, in agriculture. So having said that, thank you very much to the three panelists. Thank you for your excellent timekeeping. Thank you uh, to the IAI as well. Thank you for allowing me to moderate this event. And I would like to thank the, the participants as well and who have stayed with us uh, throughout the, the hour and a half. Anna, you have the floor for some closing remarks. Thank you, Edwin. I'd like to thank you. Thank Mercy, Ines and Noemi for their amazing presentations and a great debate as well. Lucia, thank you, Edwin, for moderating the event. Thank you, Ines, Mercy, Noemi for being our panelists. Thank you, uh, Ines and Anna, my IAI colleagues. Thank you to the particip participants as well. And hopefully we'll meet again in upcoming IAI events and in the next few days we'll be uploading the the videos. So we'll upload them on our social media and we'll be we'll see each other soon. Thank you so very much. Thank you. Bye bye. Thanks. Bye.